Hello everyone from uh, Tim and myself and a warm welcome to all you to our session at the Scottish Summit uh, titled Guardians of your Microsoft Galaxy 10 tips to make your cloud ecosystem more secure. Let us first of all thank all the organizers and everyone involved for setting up this event and for giving us the opportunity to deliver this talk. Of course, we also want to thank all sponsors because without them it would be quite impossible to set up an event like this. So thank you. So on our agenda today, first of all, we go through the 10 tips which can help you make your uh, Microsoft Cloud ecosystem uh, more secure. We'll also show some demos in between those tips. And at the end of the session, we'll go through the key takeaways uh, where we will focus on the things you really should remember about our session. Um, we also want to start with a quote before shortly introducing ourselves. So we are Groot. And my name is uh, Wima Thijssen. I live in Belgium where I work as a cloud architect. Um, since last year, I'm awarded as a Microsoft Azure MVP, which was and still is a great honor. Community-wise, I'm a founding board member of a Belgium user group called uh, MC2MC. I also have my own blog, https.wematthijssen.com, where I blog a lot about my daily experiences with Azure and all the related Microsoft hybrid cloud services. And like most IT professionals these days, I'm also on Twitter. So if you ever want to reach out, uh, ask a question, or just want to have a chat, uh, you can always contact me through my Twitter handle, at uh, Matthijssen. I think that's me in a nutshell, and we'll now let uh, Tim introduce himself. Hi, guys. Thanks for joining our session. My name is Tim Hermi. I'm a modern workplace architect uh, based from Belgium. Uh, I'm freelancing, working for the big partners in Belgium, uh, Microsoft MVP Enterprise Mobility since 2020. Uh, also recently got awarded the Windows Insider MVP award. Uh, the same as Wim, a founding board member of MC2MC. And you can follow me on Twitter with my at um, underscore cloud underscore boy hashtag. So I think, Tim, you can go ahead with the first yes. one. So first point we're going to tackle today is multi-factor authentication and conditional access. Um, and why is identity important? Uh, we have three bullet points here. 81% of breaches are caused by credential theft. Um, what do I mean with this is that mostly they are with phishing campaigns, they get the credentials of the employees and that's how they get inside in the organization. 73% um, of passwords are duplicates. Uh, what do I mean with this? Um, if I ask my mother, how many different passwords do you have on your multiple accounts, your work account, your Gmail account, her Facebook account or whatever, uh, she will tell me that she has one password. So that's, that's an issue. Not a lot of people are using different passwords for different for every platform that they have. Um, so that's a security issue. 80% of employees are using non-approved apps for work. What do I mean with this? Um, this is what I call shadow IT. Um, so we don't want our end users. No, let's let's rephrase it. We don't want our corporate data um, to end up in our end users' personal uh, Google Drive or Dropbox. And 80% of employees are using non-approved apps for work. Um, I'll show you later on in the session how we can tackle this with Microsoft's Cloud App Security also. Identity breaches, uh, there are a few good sites that you can check, um, like the Have I Been Pound. If one of your credentials have ever been exposed on the internet, you can find it there. Um, be aware that there are a lot of phishing attempts these days, um, so take that in account. So what is the answer? Um, protect at the front door, uh, simplify access to devices and apps and safeguard your credentials. Um, so what do we have to do implementing multi-factor authentication? If we implement multi-factor authentication, um, we can prevent 98% of the breaches, which is a whole lot. Um, it will also simplify access to devices and apps. Um, and when I'm doing projects and we're, we're doing an MFA rollout, um, we mostly get a lot of negative points from the from the end users that they will have an extra step to take or they'll have to uh, copy a code and to get access to some data but that's not my point of view on that if if you if mfa is, is implemented well and good uh, your end users should not have any impact on that uh, and i'll get to that later on also so what is mfa eh? 
it's a two-step verification. Uh, what what can what are the authentication methods that we can use? Um, something we know uh, is mostly a password. Uh, something we have, like a trusted device or a phone, and something we are, uh, like biometrics. And if we talk about the biometrics part, um, we're talking about Windows Hello for Business, which is a form of multi-factor authentication, also of course. Azure AD conditional access. It's a, a really great tool. Um, and it works with an if then scenario. Um, like I said, if my end user is working from his on premises environment or his known environment, his, his known IP range, he will get access. If he is working from home, for example, they will require an MFA prompt to get access. Um, so it's always an if then scenario. You can, of course, also use um, session risk and user risk. Uh, and what does that mean? If I'm logging in here now in Brussels and in five minutes someone is logging in with my account, with my account in Amsterdam, um, it will trigger a session risk because I can't get from Brussels to Amsterdam in five minutes. So uh, we can automate this also a little bit with Azure AD conditional access. So like I said, an if then scenario, when this happens, then do this. Um, when someone is logging in from outside of Belgium, for example, we block all logins uh, inside Belgium, we allow them. There are unlimited um, conditional access rules that you can make, uh, so this is a very powerful tool to use. So let us now look into the next one, uh, a break glass account. So like Tim already told you, MFA is one of the things you should uh, enable to better protect your identities. Um, but what in the case if MFA malfunction and you're, for example, not able to log in, for example, the Azure portal or, the, or that you're completely locked out of your Azure AD organization because um, you can't sign in anymore with your, uh, any of your administrative accounts. Um, to solve this, you can create two or maximum three uh, emergency access or like they say, break glass accounts. Um, this should be cloud only accounts. We use the um, on Microsoft.com domain and they should, uh, shouldn't be federated or synchronized with any on-premises environment. Um, they should have the global admin role assigned and you should exclude them uh, from MFA or any conditional access policy uh, like they mentioned before you have. Um, use for them use a long and complex password um, at least 16 characters long um, but I think in team in my opinion it's better to go for at least uh, 128 randomly generated characters um, you should also monitor these accounts uh, with for example MCAS or Azure AD audit and this to get notified in the yeah, unlikely event that an attacker has breached one of those accounts so Tim, back to you. Yes, privileged identity management. It's a very powerful tool and uh, I'll show you what it can do. So what is privileged identity management? Um, it's we're stripping away. Let me explain first. We're stripping away all roles for all our end users. Also our um, operating users like the, the help desk or the sys sysadmins. Um, but we want them to be able to activate those roles themselves just in time when they need it and also time bombed. So after they've done their work, um, the role will be stripped from them again. And this is what we call the least privileged principle. Uh, so we don't give any high level roles on our employees, but they can activate it themselves. You can put an approval flow behind it. Uh, and that's a little bit in a nutshell how it works. Um, what's important to know here, um, that the workflow so the the user the end user can go to the privileged identity management console and i'll show you this in a demo also later uh, he can see which roles that has been activated for him permanent or illegible um, he can activate a role himself if there is an approval flow behind it um, the approver will have to approve it of course uh, once approved the role will be activated um, like i said roles are time bombed so you can uh, put a time per role that, that there is, like global admin, mostly I put there one hour, uh, engine administrator eight hours, for example. Um, so when someone asks, asks the role, he will get it, and after eight hours or one hour or whatever that you have set up, the role will be 
away again. What's also very important here, um, there's a detailed reporting and auditing inside the tool, so that's also very powerful. License requirements, uh, it's not a cheap tool, eh? so you have, it's in the E5 licenses, um, Enterprise Mobility plus Security, AMS E5, uh, Microsoft 365 licenses, the educations or the normal ones uh, also in there. Um, keep in mind when a license expires that PIM features will no longer be available in your directory. Um, the audit history is also there, so that it's really powerful. Um, you can see what happens or which roles get activated and who does some changes in there. But let me show you in a demo. It will be more cool than the slides. Um, so if you go to portal.azure.com, you see here Azure AD Privileged Identity Management. You can also search for it here if we go there. And now I'm logged in with an administrator. So I'm the global admin. I have set up PIM, so I'm going to show you this first. Um, I'll show you the tasks in the second part of the demo, but first let's go to the manage part. So if we go to the manage part, we have three things, Azure AD roles, privileged access group and resources. I'm going to be talking about the roles today. So if we click on the roles and we click on manage roles, we can see all built in roles that Azure provides us. So let's say I want to see the global administrator role. I'll first show you the role settings. These are all settings that you can specify per role. So for my global admin role, I want them to only activate it for one hour. Mostly I don't want to give that role uh, for too long, uh, for, for eight hours. I require justification, so they have to tell me why do they need that role today. Uh, ticket information, so you can link it with your ticketing system. Uh, activation require MFA, uh, recommended. Always put that on yes. If you ask for a privileged role, of course we want uh, an MFA prompt to, to approve. Um, and this one is interesting, require approval to activate. You can see it's put on yes here. So if someone asks for the global administrator role, um, I'll have to activate it myself. You can see the approvers here because I want to know who is asking for the roles and why do they need it so I can make a judgment if it's okay or not. Um, if you look at another role, for example, the Intune role, you can see that this will be a little bit different. Here I've put the maximum duration at eight hours. What does this mean? That they have the whole day. Mostly if you have to do some Intune work, you will be busy with more than an hour. Um, of course, I just need, uh, of course, I again need justification. Um, but you can see here that I didn't put yes in the require approval to activate. So what does this mean? If my end user logs in and he activates his Intune administrator role, it will go automatically. He will get the role and after eight hours it will get stripped away again. Um, let me show you this in a demo. And let's see here first. You can see here eligible. So this is my demo user that I'm going to be demoing into it. Uh, you can see where it is active, this assignment, no active assignments and when it was used before. So I have one demo user, John, who is eligible for this. And let's show you the process on, on how to activate it in the end user perspective. So again, I'm going to portal.azure.com. I'll be signing in with my dummy user. And I hope I still know my password. Yes, as you can see, I didn't got an MFA prompt here. This is MCAS kicking in, you can ignore this. Yes, there we go. So my end user logs in. If we can see now, uh, I'm gonna show you what he can do at the moment. Oops. Users. Azure is slow today. Mostly yeah. this is when you're doing demos. <laughs> <laughs> We're almost there. There, John. 
So if you look at the user now, I'm logged in. I didn't activate any roles. Let's, if we look at assigned roles, you will see that I'll have an active assignment uh, of global reader. So I can see everything, but I can't change anything. Uh, and to prove this to you, let's go to, it doesn't matter what, user settings. You can see that I will be able to see everything, but I can't change any setting. Yeah? Let's say I have to do some work today, some Intune work. So the end user go to, goes to privilege identity management. He can click on tasks on my roles. This will show him all his roles that he has rights on. So you can see the Intune administrator, he can activate or the global admin. If I activate the global admin, the approval flow will kick in. So I will have to approve it um, myself. Let's show the automatic process. So I want the Intune administrator role. We click on activate. There. Additional verification required. This is why I said I didn't um, got any MFA prompt while logging in, but it is required to activate a role. So here I will get an MFA prompt first. So let's trigger that. Let's approve it there. We'll get back into PIM. Validating request, reason, demo, we'll click on activate. There, stage one, it's processing our request. That's already okay. Stage one, validating that it's successful. This will be okay in a bit also. Activation completed successfully. And normally we had to log out and log in again. Uh, a few months back, but now it's not even necessary anymore. So you'll see my browser will refresh and I will I will have my Intune administrator role. Um, if we go back to Azure Active Directory now, and I go again to users, search for my user. You will see that the role is activated and I can do my there. Do you see the start time, the end time? So I can do my my work today and when I leave after work, the role will get stripped away again. Um, so we're talking about the least privileged principle. So our ident identity is secure. Um, back to you, Wim. Okay, thank you, Tim, for the nice demo. Let me share my screen again. So I think everyone is seeing my slide deck again. So the next topic we want to talk about is just in time and uh, Azure Bastion. Um, like probably most of you know, the easiest way, but the least secure one to connect to an Azure VM um, is by using a public IP address or a PIP. Uh, in this way, you can connect to a VM through RDP on port uh, 3389 or SSH on port uh, 22, depending if the VM is a Windows or a Linux VM. Um, this kind of way of connecting to your EASIS VMs is good for uh, studying purposes or when you need to do a quick test, but you should never use them in a, any production environment because by this uh, way to connect to your VMs, one or both of the management ports uh, will be widely opened on the internet. And in this way, your VM can easily be breached by uh, with brute force attacks or port scans or even uh, zero day exploits. So better is to connect to your uh, Azure VMs in a high secure way. Uh, first of all, by using a site to site VPN or an express route. In this way, you can connect from your on premises network to the private IP address of the VM. Um, next to those two options, uh, you can also use a point to site VM uh, to set up a secure connection. Um, with a point to site VM, you can use certificate based authentication these days or radios, but you also have the option uh, to use the open VPN protocol. And even these days to use the Azure ID authentication instead of the self-signed certificate. A resource we still see a lot being used in the production environments is Jumpbox or a jump post or a, yeah, even jump server, like some people like to name it. Uh, a Jumpbox is a server, uh, it's a control entry point in your Azure environment. Um, which is used to access any other devices in a separated security zone whenever you're working in a, a, with spoke free nets in the hub spoke model. When you use um, just a jump, uh, when you use ju uh, such a jump box, it's best to enable a just in time VM access, JIT for it. 
Um, so you can control access and reduce the attack surface uh, to this jump box. Um, JIT is available if you use the Azure Defender on tier of uh, Azure Security Center. Um, how does JIT work? Uh, first of all, a user needs to request access to a VIM, and then Security Center checks if that uh, user has specific role-based access permissions uh, for it. If so, uh, the request is approved, and then Security Center in the back automatically configures the NSG, and this to allow uh, any inbound traffic, for example, uh, one of those uh, management ports like 2289 or 22. And this also for a requested amount of time. And when the set time window is uh, passed, Azure Security Center will automatically restore the energy back to its uh, original state. So these days you can also use uh, Azure Bastion to securely connect to your uh, Azure VMs. Uh, Azure Bastion is a pass service that you provision inside your virtual network and it provides you with uh, secure and seamless RDP SSH connectivity um, to any of your virtual machines and this directly from inside the Azure portal over SSL. How does it work? Uh, well, Bastion lives in its own subnet. Uh, the Azure, it's called the Azure Bastion subnet in your VNet and which exposes only ports uh, 443 uh, to the internet. Um, through your Bastion host, you then connect uh, on any port like uh, RDP 3289 or SSH 22, and this on the private IP address of your VM. And in this way, none of your VMs uh, ever need a, a public IP anymore to connect to. So try it out. It will uh, really make your environment more secure. So, but let me quickly uh, demo this. Um, let me take, show my Azure portal. So you see my Azure portal. Um, I want to show you, for example, JIT. So I have a VM running. It's like Tim already said, it's quite uh, fast is there today, uh, the Azure portal. So it's opening, it's taking its time. So you can see I have a public IP address attached to it, to the NIC. Um, if I want to connect, I just click on connect. I click on the RDP tab because it's a Windows VM. And you can see it mentions that this VM has just-in-time access policy enabled. So I first need to request access. I just click on request access. You can see the notification that it's uh, in the back uh, requesting that access. The, uh, the access is now approved. And mostly it takes up to a minute before everything in the back is in order. But if you now just download the RDP file, you can connect to it. And if you go into Security Center, you go to the Azure Defender. You scroll down completely to the bottom. You see a tab called Just-in-Time VM Access. If you now click on that one, you will see I, I have requested it's active now for that specific VM. I'm the requester. And you can even uh, look in the activity log. And for example, in that way, you can really follow who has asked access when, how long you had access, and uh, go through it from here. So, Tim, I think back to you for the next. Yes, Microsoft Defender Advanced Threat Protection. Um, you have to click again, Wim. I lost yeah. control. Yeah. Yeah. So protecting an endpoint is hard. Uh, we, in, back in the days, it was really hard to get everything right. Uh, you had the malware, phishing, ransomware, the zero days that were there, uh, advanced attacks. Um, you can go to the next slide, Wim. But protecting an endpoint was hard because now we have Defender ATP. Uh, what is Defender ATP or Defender for Endpoints, as it's called these days? Um, it's a cloud-based solution from Microsoft, uh, built-in, cloud-powered. What are the features that we have in there? Attack surface reduction, so we can resist attacks and exploits. Uh, next generation protection, uh, so it's a cloud enablement uh, virus scan, like they said. So it will get smarter and smarter with more data that's coming inside. There's also artificial, in artificial intelligence behind it. Uh, of course, we have endpoint detection and response, so it can detect, investigate, and respond to those attacks. Auto investigation and remediation. If you if you want, you can set it up that some alerts will be auto remediated uh, or auto investigated. Uh, secure posture, uh, advanced hunting, and what's not on the slide, uh, you can also consult um, experts from Microsoft to help you 
um, with setting it up. Uh, yes. Also good to know it integrates a lot with the whole Microsoft Echo Suite, of course. Um, it will it integrates with Microsoft Cloud App Security, which I will be talking about in a bit, but also with Intune. So we can, for example, if we work in two different silos, two different teams, we have a SecOps team and a device management team. Um, if the SecOps team finds out in a Defender for Endpoint that some there are some vulnerabilities in some applications, for example, uh, they can log a ticket directly from the MDATP dashboard into Intune so the other team can pick it up. Uh, so it works really good together uh, and that's the power of the Microsoft ecosystem. We have all these different flavors, uh, different tools, but they all, <coughs> sorry, they all talk to each other. So that's really nice. Yes. So our sixth tip, um, Azure Service Cell and Azure Advisor. So you also have some free Azure services which can help you to manage, secure, and optimize your Azure resources. Uh, one of them is uh, Azure Service Cell. Um, Azure Service Cell will notify you of issues in the Azure backbone that have an impact on any of your Azure resources or any of your Azure services you, you're using. Um, it not only helps you understand those issues, but also will tell you uh, what the impact of, that, of those issues is. Uh, you can see it kind of your personal guidance and support by uh, yeah, whenever there is an issue in the backbone um, and Microsoft will keep you informed and how they will resolve that specific issue. And uh, at the end, they will also inform you when the issue is finally resolved. Um, you have four different types of uh, events where Azure Service Help can inform you about. Um, the first one is service issues. Um, this one will inform you about outages and issues that could cause any problems for the resources that you have running within any of your Azure subscriptions. Next to that, you can also get uh, visibility when plant maintenance, plant maintenance is on hand for, uh, for example, your Azure VMs. And then you also have uh, health and security advisories. Um, here you can get informed about uh, Azure features or services you're using that are being phased out or uh, replaced. Or you, for example, you can be informed uh, if you exceed a specific uh, usage quota. Another great free service you can use is uh, Azure Advisor. Uh, you can see it as your free personal in-house uh, cloud consultant. Um, it will give you personalized best practices um, to optimize and secure your, any of your Azure workloads. And this for uh, the workloads in all your subscriptions. Um, it does this by using uh, telemetry data gathered from various uh, Azure monitor services. And currently, uh, you can use uh, five Azure, uh, Azure Advisor dashboards, uh, which can help you. First of all, we have high availability. You also have uh, security. Um, the security one is integrated with Azure Security Center in the back. They also have uh, performance and operation excellence. And the fifth one is a uh, cost, uh, which can help you to reduce your uh, cloud spin. A good best practice is uh, to create a service health and advisor uh, alerts. Um, this will help you to get informed about all service health events and advisor recommendations yeah, you want to be informed about, and uh, this without the need uh, of opening the Azure portal. So you can set it up that you will receive an email when there is a new Azure service issue or when advisor picks up a new uh, recommendation, it can be sent to you uh, through email, for example. So Tim, back to you. Yes, Azure AD security defaults, uh, very powerful. Uh, first thing you have to know here is if you're spinning up a new tenant, so um, you, you're just going to the to the Microsoft Cloud or you're just moving to Exchange Online or whatever is the reason that you're only now <laughs> spinning it up. But all new tenants will have this feature enabled by default. So take that in advice uh, and I'll uh, tell you a bit about the other side uh, in a minute or two. What is Azure AD security defaults? Um, it will enable a few things. It will enable to require all users to register for multi-factor authentication, which is good. Require administrators to perform multi-factor authentication, which is really good. Blogging legacy authentication, which is a no-brainer. Um, require users to perform multi-factor authentication when necessary. And it will protect privileged activities like access to the Azure portal. Um, some of these things were um, default 
conditional access rules back in the day. So a few months back, we had these five or six default conditional access rules. Um, they don't exist anymore, so they, they've made this into the security defaults part. So what do you have to know? If you're in a small organization, you want to keep your data, your clouds secure, uh, please enable security defaults. Um, if you're in a bigger organization, you will you will want more control over everything. So you, you will be working with conditional access rules. Uh, you'll have to disable it then. Either way, you're using the security defaults or you're using conditional access rules. Yes, back to you, Wim. Okay. So our A tip, role-based access control or RBAC and a resource lock. So access management for your Azure resource is also an important security aspect uh, you need to take care of. Luckily with uh, RBAC, a free to use uh, authorization uh, system built into uh, Azure Resource Manager, you can really control who has access to your Azure resources, what they can do with them, and what areas they have access to. Um, so RBAC will give you a fine-grained control over users' access to any of your Azure resources. And you can not only monitor their users, but also control the resources and service, uh, like I said, they have access to. You should always implement at least a privileged access model, um, just like Tim told you uh, with previous uh, tips. And just so you just give users minimum access they need uh, to fulfill their tasks. How does RBAC work? Um, first of all, you define a security principle, uh, which is an object that uh, can represent a user, a group, or a service principle, uh, which is used by applications to access resources, or uh, even a managed identity. Uh, for people who don't know, managed identity is an identity in Azure AD that is uh, automatically managed by Azure and mostly used uh, whenever someone, uh, for example, develops an uh, application in Azure. Secondly, you define a role, eh, the permissions you want to grant. And uh, the third one, you define the scope, uh, which can be a management group, a subscription, a resource group, or even a specific resource. Um, some examples when you can use RBAC, uh, for example, to allow one user to manage VMs in a uh, subscription and another user uh, to manage virtual networks. Another example is to allow uh, DBA, for example, to manage all Microsoft SQL Server databases in the specific subscriptions. Um, and depending on the role a user has, he has the capability to do more or less things. Like you can see on the slide, for example, uh, the backup reader can view only view anything. The backup operator, for example, can also enable backups and restore in Azure Backup. And the backup contributor can uh, yeah, do almost everything. Um, RBAC uh, has several built-in roles that you can assign. Uh, currently, you can uh, use around uh, 70 plus uh, built-in roles, um, like there is owner, virtual machine contributor, uh, backup reader, uh, backup contributor, and so on. Um, but if the built-in roles don't meet your specific needs, you can also create your own custom roles. Um, best way to do that is that you copy a built-in role and start from there by adjusting it uh, to your own needs. Um, let us now talk a little bit about resource logs and how you can uh, use them in your environment. Um, you can use resource logs to prevent unexpected changes or modifications uh, or even uh, worst case accidental deletion of resources. Um, there are two types of logs. First, you have the cannot delete. Um, it will be shown as delete in the Azure portal where you as a user can read and modify the resource, but you can't delete it. And secondly, you have the read only shown as read only in the Azure portal, um, where you can only read the resources, but you can't do make any changes to it. So you can't modify it or delete it. Um, the thing you should keep in mind is that only users who have the required uh, uh, rights, uh, like owner or uh, user access administrator, can uh, create or delete logs. Um, and resource logs these days can be applied on, uh, yeah almost everything on subscription resource group or uh, resources itself. Um, and when applying logs, you need to watch out um, when applying them to specific resource groups, uh, for example, the ones where uh, storage accounts live in and the one for Azure Backup, because if you place it on uh, those groups, uh, it can make uh, those things uh, not working anymore. But let me quickly demo this. Let me go back to my Azure portal. So. For example, I have a specific resource group. 
you can see them all. For example, I have my Bastion resource group. Um, if I go to the locks, it's opening. You can see I have a do not delete lock on this one. So if I now try to open it again, I go to the overview page, and I try to delete this specific resource group. Let me copy this one quickly. You can see I will get a notification that I can't delete it because this uh, specific resource group is locked. So let me take another resource group. I have another resource group, for example, on this one. I didn't put any lock on it. So if I now go to the overview, you can see I have a specific resource in there. Even that resource, if I try to delete this resource group, it should, should work without any problem, and even the resource will be deleted. So, Tim, back to you for the next one. Yes, Microsoft Cloud App Security. Uh, next slide. Yep. Yeah. So, what's, what's the pain point here, or why did Cloud App Security come into life? Um, if we look back 15, 15 years ago, we were all on-prem uh, working at our fixed desk in our fixed uh, perimeter or environment. Um, cloud apps didn't exist. We had all everything running on-premises. But with the shift to cloud, more and more cloud apps are appearing. So we have more and more use cases um, to get uh, our data secure or to control where our data is going to. Um, so what are some of the top cost use cases? Um, sanctioning and unsanctioning apps. We can audit all applications uh, or SaaS applications that are on the devices of our end users. Um, they will have a score. Microsoft will put a score next to it and we can then um, see if we will sanction them, approve them or unsanction them, disallow them. Um, what are some other things that we can do? Uh, we can monitor sessions in real time, um, classify labeling and protecting sensitive information Covered and discovered apps. Um, also, app registrations will get will get scores. Um, an app registration that that asks for a lot of privileged role, um, data that asks for a lot of privileged data will have a higher score, uh, a lower score than a, than an app that doesn't do that. For example, um, yes. Next slide, Wim. Thanks. So. A uni uniquely integrated CASP, what does that mean? And like I said before, it's the Microsoft ecosystem, so everything works together really well. Um, if we have already have Defender for Endpoint uh, running in our organization, it will work together with Microsoft Cloud App Security. Um, identity and access management, so Azure AD and conditional access are integrated as well. Data loss prevention, uh, Azure Security Center. That's the power of the Microsoft ecosystem. Um, the only thing I can mention here is when using all these different tools, uh, we have Defender running, um, Defender for Office 365, for example, we have MCAS running, uh, it will trigger alerts. So we'll have to check different dashboards for the different alerts. It will have to be followed up. Um, you can take it even more next level and implement Sentinel, which comes at a cost, of course, uh, but you can centralize all your tickets or your, your, your incidents in Sentinel also. So yeah, next slide. Twim. So like uh, you see here, this is the cloud discovery dashboard um, working together with Defender for Endpoints. We can see on how much is machines certain software is installed. And you can also see that Microsoft gives the score here. Um, how does Microsoft give the score? Um, if, you're, if that application doesn't comply to certain compliance terms or ISO terms or or um, it doesn't use certificates for, for logging in, for example, it will get a low, lower score, uh, but I will show you this in a demo. Um, let me take over the screen. So if you go to Cloud App Security and how do you get there? Each Cloud App Security will get his custom link, but if you want to go there or you forgot the link or you get into a new organization and you want to go to the Cloud of Security dashboard, you can always type portal.cloudappsecurity.com and you will be redirected automatically to the dashboard of the organization. Um, I'll show you a few things here which are important for me. Um, the first part is the discovery part. We have the cloud discovery dashboard. 
and discovered apps. It's all apps that are discovered uh, through Defender for Endpoint in our organization. The score that you can see here, um, like I said, the score is um, you get a score if you uh, are confirmed with certain things. And if you click on it here, you can see what I mean. So it will give a, a lower score because here it can remember passwords. It does it supports SAML, uh, it supports file sharing. So it's not compliant with ISO 27001, for example. So if you are compliant with all those things, your score will be higher. So this, these are the discovered apps. So the apps that are already in your organization. If you want to block an app, for example, before it is discovered, you can go to the Cloud App Catalog. And I can demo you this because I already put one up for demo purposes. So Twitch, it's nothing um, out of the order or it's a gaming platform, but just for demo purposes, you can see that I here unsanctioned the app. So I just flipped the switch here and I unsanctioned the app. So that means that my end users will not be able to open it anymore. And to show you this, in Edge, of course, smart screen will kick in. So that's normal. Microsoft products works together. Um, but if I open it in Chrome now, there, you can see that it is also denied. Um, and this is blocked on network level access. So it works together with Defender for Endpoint. And I'll get a notification here. Um, even further, if I would, because Twitch also has an, an application you can inst install, I think, if I would be able to get the exe on my computer and start it, it will also be blocked. So you, it, it is blocked on all levels. Uh, what's also good to know about MCAS that I'm going to show you before I stop my demo, um, we have also an investigate part, so you can investigate um, file usage or where are files going to or user accounts. Um, but here control is also really nice. There are a lot of policies that you can activate and those policies will trigger the alerts. Uh, like I said, we will have, we'll have alerts in all different dashboards unless you're using Sentinel to centralize them. Um, but these are things that you can simply enable and uh, that are built in already. There are also a lot of templates that you can customize, like if a mouse download by a single user, if more than 50 downloads within one minute is, is happening, maybe you want to be notified about that. Um, but if you're new or, or if, if MCAS is new for you, um, go through these templates and look at them. There are a lot of them that are built in already. Uh, so if you want to get it up, up and running fast, it's definitely possible. OK, Wim, back to you. OK, let me share my screen again. So it will be showing now. So the last uh, tip we want to mention is uh, Azure Security Center. Um, Azure Secure, you can see Azure Security Center as your main stop when you need to uh, a first broad overview of your Azure environment security posture. Um, it provides you with a centralized view of your Azure resources like your EAS VMs and their active security state. And if there's a potential to improve your uh, security on those, uh, Azure Security Center will give you recommendations that explain how yeah, one of those specific resources can be better protected. And in this way, Azure Security Center helps you to not only prevent, but also detect and respond to all kinds of uh, security threats to any of your Azure resources, and even these days on-prem resources. Um, security Center is offered uh, in two modes. Um, Azure Defender Off, which is also called the Azure Security Center free tier, in which you can use uh, for free on all your uh, Azure subscriptions. It will be enabled when you first visit the Azure Security Center dashboard uh, in the, through the Azure portal, or uh, you, you can even enable it via uh, any API. Um, this free mode includes continuous assessment and security recommendations, um, and even a secure score. Next to the free mode, you can also enable Azure Defender on, uh, which then extends the capabilities of the free mode to workloads running in private and other uh, public clouds. And by this, providing uh, security management and threat protection across your uh, yeah, hybrid cloud workloads. And then, for example, uh, you can for, uh, use a JIT, JIT like I uh, demoed in a previous tip. 
Um, to analyze how well your Azure environments are protected from various threats, you can uh, simply use a secure score from within Security Center. Um, secure score will review your, your security recommendations and will prioritize them for you. So you know which recommendations to perform first. Um, and your security sc secure score is based on the number of security center recommendations you have already completed. And to decide which recommendations to resolve, resolve first, you should look at the severity of each one and its potential impact on your secure score. Um, you kind of can see a secure score as your uh, in-house security analyst and consultant. So this was uh, our session, but before closing off, we just want to give you some uh, key takeaways. First of all, uh, know that identity is a new security parameter and that you should really take uh, try to secure all your cloud identities. Next, uh, create your break glass accounts. So when the MFA malfunctions, you're still able to manage your Azure tenant and Azure resources. Also, uh, keep your privilege users under control with PIM uh, so you can limit the time someone can perform privilege tasks. And definitely never use a PIP to connect to your uh, production EAS VMs. Uh, better to use is a point to site VPN, a Gembox with JIT enabled, or uh, the new uh, Azure uh, Pass service, Azure Bastion. You should also use the power of MCAS and MDATP uh, against, uh, to, to protect you against your uh, shadow IT. And the last one, but Definitely not the least one. Use all built-in Azure free services and tools uh, and these to better secure environments. Uh, so you can use Azure Advisor, Azure Security Center, the free and uh, Azure Service Help, for example. So this was our uh, session. Uh, the only thing to arrest us is uh, to thank you. And if you ever want to uh, contact uh, one of us, uh, our Twitter handles uh, are on this deck. So thank you uh, for your attention and uh, till next time. Thanks all. Goodbye.